Falcons fans, heck, NFL fans everywhere. I am so excited to have today's guest on. He's a former sports agent who helped found, correct me if I'm wrong, Premier Sports and Entertainment, uh, represents coaches and athletes. He's represented a ton of athletes, including Shaquille O'Neal, Hakeem Olajuwon, Ronnie Lott, and probably a, a ton of other NFL uh, players. I know he has, and I don't know how many former Falcons he's represented. We'll get into that in a minute. But he's appeared on ESPN, CBS. I work with him at CBS Sports. He writes Agents Take, he's, and he's been on countless radio shows across the country. Ladies and gentlemen, Falcons Nation, I am so stoked to introduce my friend, former colleague, Joel Corey. Joel, great to see you, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Good. You look good, man. Where are you these days? Uh, sunny Las Vegas, Nevada, where it is going to be 70 degrees today. Wow. Yeah, rub it in. All right. So coming up hey, on this show. You live in the deep south. You, you, it never gets <laughs> that cold. I, I remember when, cold, I was, when I was when uh, I was at Emory, they canceled class once because of a forecast of snow. And I'm like, <laughs> you wait till it actually snows? Growing up, in right. growing up in Nashville, we actually had to have snow before high school got canceled. Well, you remember, I was down in Fort Lauderdale at CBS. So coming up here is like, you know, coming up to the, the, the north. <laughs> yeah, that is true. That is true. So, well, let's let's get to the topics we're going to cover. We're going to cover the looming salary cap, which looks like a reduction. Uh, we're going to talk about the Falcon salary cap, Joel, and how that's going to impact roster decisions. I hope you've been studying up on the Falcons roster. I know you. I know you've been writing about a lot of different teams. And then if we have time... I want to talk about the uh, the New Orleans Saints uh, because you know Falcons fans feel pretty bad about you know the impending gloom and doom of the salary cap. Well, the Saints actually have kind of a worse situation. But um, let's just jump right into it. Let's just get right into the salary cap. And there's so much to unpack, Joel. But if you could, in in I, I'm not saying cliff notes, but what is the big issue right now with the salary cap as far as this? A possible reduction and what's it mean for just teams in general? Well, revenues went down drastically because of the coronavirus pandemic. There were no stands in the fans for no fans in the stands for the most part. Yep. And that reversed yep. the first time. So uh, <laughs> local revenue is approximately 35, 40% of league wide revenue. So when you don't have that, that's a major piece of the pie. So the yeah. NFL and NFL PA um, in the preseason, agreed to limit the losses for this year, at least how they count cap wise, the, the salary cap floor of 175 million the losses may be more than that, but the cap won't be any lower than 175 million. If they have to, they'll borrow from future years and spread mm -hmm. those losses out um, over 2022, 2023 and 2024, if necessary. Um, the cap right now is 198.2 million pre pandemic the planning the teams had was conservatively the cap would go up roughly six, 7% to the $210 million range. So you're talking salary cap planning and teams planning three year snapshots of 210 million to now you're dealing with worst case scenario, 175 million. Um, if the NFL can get the new media rights deals done before uh, the league year starts on March 17th, the 21, mm -hmm. 2021 league year. That could Coming be a out. game changer. And yeah. the NFL would feel more comfortable borrowing from future years and keeping the cap as close to remaining flat as possible, knowing the infusion of revenue would be certain. If you don't have the new TV deals done, then expect the cap to be 180 million, maybe 185 at best which is terrible for players because teams, since they were, we're planning talking for Joel, we're talking about how much, how much drop per team that 20 some million. Yeah. You're talking about planning for 210 initially, and you're going to be at 180. So yeah. you're talking okay. 30 million below what your expectation More. is. That's going to be a buyer's market. Teams are going to have to cut players. They wouldn't otherwise cut to be cap compliant, which means that, there will be a great amount of supply exceeding demand in free agency. So you don't want to be a free agent unless you're one of the top guys, they'll get paid regardless, but yeah. everyone else, it, 
it's going to be a bleak outlook. If a team asks you to take a pay cut under those circumstances, you may want to consider it because a bird in a hand may be worth two in the bush this year. Um, hopefully everything gets back to normal in the 2021 season. You have fans in the stands the whole year and the Super Bowl is a sellout like it always is. And in 2022, uh-huh. then the cap can start going back up. TV deals should be done by then and it'll be business as usual. So if I'm a free agent, I may take a one year deal if I'm a younger guy, if I can't find the money I want in a long term deal and try to hit it again in 2022. Just unfortunate that you would happen to have an expiring contract in this year if you didn't have a have a great year. So, yeah, a lot of guys are going to have to bet on themselves is what you're saying, right? Yes. More so than would in the past. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, What do you you talk to a lot of GMs and a lot of front office people still? Uh, What is your sense if you had to make a prediction right now of what you think will happen? What, you know, with the TV deal and what you think that that number is, you know, what's the solve? What do you think? What do you think happens, uh, you know, based on your what you're hearing and what you think? Well, nobody, the TV deal is the unknown variable. Nobody knows if right. those are going to get done. But some teams are using 175, the uh, floor for planning now. Some are using 180. But teams aren't using anything remotely close to the current level, 198.2 million um, for their cap planning for the 2021 season. And so by they're now, planning for worst case, you're saying? Yes. Well, you always yeah. plan conservatively if you're running a team salary cap. You can't go, hey, the cap's going to go up 10%. And then if it doesn't, you've been planning for 10%, you're kind of screwed. Um, One thing which it is going to affect is the later that uh, the NFL sets the salary cap, because typically projections preliminarily are made in December. We have a conservative range where the cap is. And then end of February, when the combine takes place, typically, which it isn't like it would normally in Indianapolis, is when the cap is finally set early March. So everyone knows what they're doing. Um, the uh, franchise and transition tag numbers are a percentage of the cap. So you won't know the exact numbers until the 2021 salary cap is set. But regardless, since the cap is expected to go down, those numbers are going to drop. Like I'll use an example for one. Derek Henry, um, his franchise tag was $10.278 million, uh, this year as a running back. Now, if the cap is at the floor, of 175 million, then that mm-hmm. number is going to be 8.4 because the way the franchise tags work, that it's the average of the top five salaries at a position over a five year period, where, you, where it's a complicated formula, more so than it was under previous CBAs, where you take the sum of the, the franchise tag numbers for the past five years, the sum of the salary caps divide those two numbers into each other, multiplied by what the salary cap is. And that's what the number is for position. So if the cap right. drops, those numbers are going to drop dramatically. Yeah. Wow. Whew. So I can't, obviously it behooves everybody to get this TV deal then. And, and I've read on pro football talk uh, in different places there, they, and then you tweeted out something yesterday, that CNBC story about how this could be a game changer, this new deal. Correct. Yeah, because if I haven't seen television or media rights deals go down, right. the day that happens, God forbid the sport for if it's a cap sport for that, because then everybody's salaries go down. The expectation is there's going to be a substantial increase in the media rights deals. Because if you look at the highest rated TV programs, even though the Super Bowl number viewership was down, the ratings were down, it's yeah. dominated by NFL telecasts because yeah. TV Tell ratings are, are down across the board because of cord cutting primetime TV isn't what it used to be. But one thing you can count on to generate ratings is the NFL. So why the, do you think it's going to go up? Because there's other players in the game and because there's talk of going 17 games, less preseason. And then ESPN wants to be from what I read, ESPN wants to in ABC, ESPN, ABC wants to get in that Super Bowl rotation. Right. Is so is that kind of the next factor? Yeah, that also helps. Anytime you're going to add more inventory, extra game, they add more inventory by increasing the playoffs. And if you have a party which is on the outside looking in, wanting to get in, that's a league's dream. Uh, We've seen the last round of baseball uh, rights go up. The NBA's went up dramatically. 
the NFL is still the ratings king. So the anticipation yep. is that they're still they're going to go up dramatically as well. Deal's going to get done before the league new the new league year. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. People thought they uh, might be done during, during the regular season. I have no inside knowledge about that. So if they get okay. done, that's great for the cap. If not, then it's going to be a year you where you don't want to be a player unless you're a marquee <laughs> free agent. Yeah. How big too, was it to get that 10 year CBA deal done before, you know, the, before the pandemic hit and everything like that? Well, as it was hitting. Well, the funny thing is that thing barely passed by the players because yeah. there was a faction of players and, and Aaron Rodgers, who was Green Bay's player rep and on the player rep board, was very vocal in his opposition that he didn't think that the players were getting enough to give up a 17th game. Now, nobody knew the pandemic was coming. I would hate to see what the situation would have looked like if we played the 2020 season in the last year of the CBA under 2011 CBA, and then they're going to have to go and negotiate a new CBA in a pandemic Ooh. environment. I would imagine there'd be a work stoppage and there would be a lockout like in 2011 because the owners would use the pandemic as a reason to extract concessions from players that they've always wanted. In 2011, they clawed back a lot of stuff from the 2006 CBA, which they thought was too player friendly. And I think you would see the same dynamic again, or maybe the players would have a little more resolve just because they would feel that the owners are unfairly or unjustifiably using the pandemic to try to rectify or remedy a situation that didn't necessarily need to be remedied. So some players weren't all that happy about the new deal, but given what it, it could have right been thing. in this environment, yeah. yeah, it worked out well for the players. Really well. Under the circumstances that were going to be that were unforeseen at the time. Yeah, thank goodness we're not in that situation. Oof. All right, well, let's segue right into the Atlanta Falcons, Joel. How bad is it? I get questions all the time. And that's why I'm really excited. How long have I been asking you to come on? Uh, I think since what, 17, since I got here, right? Oh, not that been, long. <laughs> come on. <laughs> it feels like it. Um, but how bad is it? You know, I Falcons fans, you get, you know, you know how it is with fandom. They, they, some of them just overreact, knee jerk and, you know, but it's not great, Bob. Uh, what's the Falcon situation in a nutshell? If you, you know, going into this right now it's it's one of the worst in the league uh it's probably bottom five but there are a couple teams which are way worse um if the cap is going to be 180 the uh, falcons are roughly 32 million over the cap uh there are ways where you can try to um create cap room there's some obvious guys you would release like ricardo allen james carpenter allen bailey the ones that come to mind about releasing and if you released ricardo allen you're going to pick up 6.25 6.25 million in cap room for release James Carpenter. That's about 4 million. Alan Bailey gets you about 4.5 million. There's some obvious guys to restructure. Um, Jake Matthews has the highest offensive line cap number in the NFL at 20.2 million. Grady in the Jarrett. NFL. Okay, yeah, yeah. Highest offensive line cap number in the NFL. J- Grady Jarrett's number four at um, defensive tackles at 20.833 million. And then Deion Jones, it's got a $12.63 million cap number. That's another one that screams salary uh, restructure. By restructure, I mean you're pushing cap obligations into tomorrow, kicking the can down the road where you take base salary or other salary components like a roster bonus, convert it into signing bonus, and you can take the amount that you convert into signing bonus and prorate it over the life of the contract. Or if you want to get it really creative, like the saints do, you can start adding voidable voiding years to the contract. So you can stretch out, stretch out the proration for over more years, create more cap room because the voting years count for proration purposes, but there's a cost to that because then you're going to have more dead money um, when those years void. Now, if you're talking Grady Jarrett, he's under contract through 2022. So you could take like um, 12 and a half million because you have to have minimum base salary at at least. You don't have to drop drop it down to a minimum base salary. You can take a restructure and cut the base salary to whatever you want. And the reason I say you can cut it to wherever you want is in these contracts over the past Mm -hmm. decade or so, teams have inserted in the addendums automatic salary conversion rights. So it's no longer a negotiation between the agent and the team 
on the restructure, which it was 20 years ago. And I had one, I'm not going to name him, but one of the top guys in terms of managing the cap curse me out because we had a player on his team where we'd restructured the year before. And to me, I'm like, I'm doing you a favor. I don't want to do you another favor. So why well, need something in return, like more money or something, exaggerated mm. payment schedule. Otherwise I wasn't going to do it. And he cursed me out over that teams to avoid that <laughs> have started putting automatic conversion rights in the contract where they can convert however much money they want. And then it's considered a breach of contract. If the player doesn't execute a new contract, which, uh, has the terms of the restructure. Now, in Grady Jarrett's case, you chop him down to his minimum base salary. It's, it's 990, but it's, let's say a million for a round number. You can take 12.5, convert it in the salary cap uh, in, the, in the signing bonus. You create 6.25 million in cap room. Jake Matthews under contract three years. His minimum base salary is 1.075 million. You can take a little over 11.9, convert that into um, signing bonus. You can save almost 8 million. Deion Jones under contract through 2023, 7.2 you could convert. So that's four. That, so that's uh, 4.8 you could create. Two guys I wouldn't touch: Matt Ryan, Julio Jones. Even though Matt Ryan has a second highest cap number in the league, soon to be the highest because Ben Roethlisberger's number is going to come down one way or another. Matt Ryan's is just under 41 million. You've restructured that three times, so I wouldn't touch that. Um, Julio Jones, top wide receiver cap number to low over 23 million. Mm -hmm. um, I would kind of leave that alone as well. If you, if you have to, if you're going to restructure, you, you're one of those guys, you don't do the full restructure where you take the base salary down to the absolute minimum. You would do it at a different level. So Joel, it, I'm going to break it down even more simpler. It, what I'm hearing from you is that you know, the rookies that you draft and, and the guys that you draft and, the, and, and those guys, they're going to get their paid, right? And then you're talking about not touching Matt Ryan and Julio Jones because of their high, high cap number, and you just don't want to spread that out. You're talking about the guys that are kind of in the middle class, so to speak, in the middle and either working with them on the solve here is to do it quickly as possible. Either you're going to have to make tough decisions and – part ways or restructure some of these guys and other guys are going to have to just either take one year deals bet on themselves. And it's not like they're going to find a lot of other takers uh, because everybody's kind of in this situation. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, that, that, that's fair. It also means in free agency, um, even though the saints one year when they had no cap room came out of nowhere and signed Jarrett's bird, maybe not as paid safety. They did it yeah. in a manner where you had a small first year cap number ballooning second year cap number. So if the Falcons create enough cap room or at least start a new league year, they're compliant. They could uh, sign one of these guys under that approach. Also the Falcons use a contract structure, which has now started to come back in vogue, which had really gone away, which is a signing bonus option bonus structure where you have a signing bonus, which gets prorated over five years. And in the second year, you have an option bonus to exercise an option year, which would be the last year of the contract. You prorate the option bonus um, like a signing bonus, and that's going to keep the second cap year number low as well. The problem with that is, and this goes back to a guy several years ago, it was used with Sam Baker. And Sam Baker didn't pan out. And when you released him, you had a ton of dead money because you have mm -hmm. multiple sets of proration. You've got the signing bonus proration and the option bonus proration. Um, that type of structure was used with Matt Ryan's contract and they restructured it three times. So that's why his cap number is so high and why if you cut Matt Ryan, which nobody's thinking about doing, it would add to the cap. And even if you traded him before June 2nd, it goes from being almost 41 million to almost 44.5 million in terms of the, the dead money is more than the cap hit. One yeah. guy to me, that's interesting to take a look at is Dante Fowler. He's got a cap number about 18, five. He's got 6 million of his 2020 base salary already guaranteed. It's 13 million as a total base. The other 7 million is fully guaranteed fifth day of the 21 league year. He's a guy that if he's on the open market, doesn't do well. If you cut him conventionally, it doesn't make a lot of sense because he's got the guarantee. Then you got the bonus proration accelerating from 2022. 
hit in 2021 that it's not worth your time. You either have to make him what's called a post June one designation Mm -hmm. where you carry him on the cap until June 2nd, even though he's released. And then at that point you can remove um, the 7 million that's not guaranteed and you delay the proration from 2022 from hitting the cap in 2021, you pick up almost 11 million in cap room that way. I might go another route um, instead. I would approach him about a pay cut because he's got the 6 million, no matter what. If he gets cut based on what he did last year, he's not going to get a ton of money in an environment where the cap is going to go down. And also knowing that he has a 6 million, he's not looking most likely to chase money. He's looking at opportunity. So I would try to get him to take a pay cut anywhere between five and 7 million personally. And then he could have the opportunity to make it back through incentives where if he's sacking the quarterback at a pretty, pretty high rate, he can be made whole. All right. So you're just doing with the basic math and who knows what kind of decisions Terry Fontenot, the new GM is going to make. He came from the saints, as you know. Uh, But if you're a Falcons fan and you've got a basic understanding of the cap and you understand, okay, Joel Corey just said, can't touch Matt Ryan or Julio Jones. Well, you can, draft, but there's a cost. Well, there's you could, cost. but it's, there's a cost. And eventually, you know, you could do different deals where you can spread it out, but you eventually got to pay the bills. And so how do they have success in 2021? And is this an opportunity for Terry Fontenot? You know, you come in and you've got the number four pick, and you know you've got to put your imprint on this team, Joel. And you've got six picks plus some compensatory picks. It, how do you fix this situation? How do you put your stamp on this team to have success in 2021 and beyond? What do you think in, you know, without going into, you know, the dissertation about, you know, all these, you know, different things and paths and, and options they can have. What, what do you think makes sense? Uh, you know, for them as they kind of head into free agency, the draft, and 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 look at this roster um, to 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 be able to have depth. Can they have depth to be able to? Um, do they trade down? Do they get more draft picks? Is this an opportunity where you maybe try to make some moves and acquire more picks? Uh, because if you hit on draft picks, that's that's the ultimate contract, right? You get those guys. And, uh, you know, if you tell me, so, and, and do the, if they do or do not have sex, sex, success in 2021, what, what, how long will it take realistically, you think? Well, you guys have been kind of stuck in neutral the past couple of years where you are better than the record indicates. You have to pretty much assume Tampa Bay is going to win the NFC South. The Saints are a wild card because that team's going to be dramatically different. Drew Brees is, is um, retiring as well. So I don't think you're winning the division. Um, the way Matt Ryan and Julio Jones's contracts and cap numbers are structured, you're probably keeping them at least for one more year. Um, you're not going to be able to make substantial additions through free agency unless you're able to get guys – when it's a complete buyer's market that's going to be higher quality talent than would normally be available to take one year deals and for bargain basement rates. And you go there, you're right about, you think that's uh, going to happen. You think there's going to be, you think if the caps are around 180, t- if the cap around is 180 yeah. or less. Yeah. You're going to see guys doing that left and right. Then it's going to become, I'm trying to position myself for the best possible way for me to have success to hit the market in 2022. So um, you did touch on one thing, which is very important. If you have a low cost quarterback, then you can amass talent around him. You have the number four pick Matt Ryan's no spring chicken. Um, He's on the back nine of his career. Um, So that's your opportunity to have a successor in waiting that can take over in 2022. Cause nowadays you play quarterback sooner rather than later. And, or possibly if the season's going terribly, um, you trade them before the trading deadline. And that way, after June 1, the proration from future years doesn't hit the cap in 2021. And you go from there. 
um, I have a radical idea of how you hit the reset button this year. It's never been done. and It'll require a lot of patience. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll explain it. Um, there's one ready-made team that's looking for a quarterback to me, Indianapolis Colts. That a quarterback older than Matt Ryan this year in Phillip Rivers. Now, knowing that if you traded him before June 2nd, they did pretty good with that old quarterback. Yeah, yeah. they did. Probably would have done better if they went after an older quarterback that they didn't uh, chase at all, uh, who won a Super Bowl, but that's a different story. But if you trade Matt Ryan before June 2nd, it's going to increase the cap. So you're going to put about $4 million, $4.5 million on the cap that way if you trade him before then. If we have an unconventional offseason like we uh, had last year, then there's no OTAs, there's no – mini camp. So what would Matt Ryan be missing on a new team? Uh, not all that much uh, compared to a uh, uh, what you'd have in a normal year. So you require a lot of patience, but if Indianapolis doesn't get their veteran quarterback and then maybe post June 1, June 2nd, that's the trade. He goes to Indy you don't have all the acceleration from the massive bonus proration from the multiple restructures hit the cap in 2021. That's a 2022 cap charge. That'll be about 26 million. You only have the 17, nine of proration this year. You pick up 23 million in cap room because you're not paying a salary and go mm-hmm. from there. That's just the mm-hmm. radical extreme idea. You never see a team teams talk about a trade or have something in place and then delay it for cap purposes. So that's just food for thought. I don't see that realistically happening, but you never know if any does, if Indianapolis is still looking for a quarterback, well, you, a better you quarterback a, come. Well, what are the teams out there that need a quarterback? You've got new England possibly, right? Possibly. Yeah. You've got Chicago, right? Yeah. They're, they're, well, someone's going to presumably end up with uh, Carson Wentz. I always thought Indianapolis made the most sense. And if I'm in Indianapolis, I'm insisting on a package deal to get that done. If you want more compensation, if you're looking for significant compensation, I'm like, hey, let's send his best target over there who they already have a ready-made successor in Philly for. Um, Zach Ertz and Carson Wentz go to Indy. And would I don't you, know what, you read, I mean, I don't, pick, I don't I mean, want Carson Wentz after what I saw, but Frank yeah, Wright yeah. had success with them. Um, yeah, that's true. The Bears – scream quarterback yeah. the redskins scream veteran quarterback alice smith isn't the answer. great comeback um never thought we'd see that happen but phenomenal story yeah yeah they're limited with him at quarterback um we'll see what happens with this, this deshaun watson thing i wouldn't trade him um if i'm uh, nick casario to me he's gonna have to sit significant time for me to uh consider trading him so we'll see how that goes um, well I'll, I'll just i'll say this too what if you say you know what hey matt ryan look look at the production from matt ryan you know 10 10 seasons four thousand plus yards what if you bolster that offensive line like i had in my mock draft today what if you say you know what? quarterbacks are playing longer they are what if you say you know what let's is it realistic to restructure Matt and say, you know, he's our guy for the next five, five years. Do you save money that way? Yeah. He's what? 36 now. Um, 35. Then you're going to, yeah, they are playing longer. I don't know if he wants to be Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers in terms of, I don't know either, but still the wheels at a high level. Yeah, yeah, he is. But his cap number next year is like 41.6 million. So that's going to be an albatross around your, your cap as well because of the multiple restructures you've done three already you keep doing it you're kicking the can down the road then you're committing to him to be your quarterback giving him significant leverage to get a new contract because you'll need to do it to lower the cap room tom condon ain't taking a discount so whatever the top of the market is (laughs) if it's 45 you every time you sign him you you make him the first or second highest paid guy so you're you're committing to paying a quarterback who at some point starts to have diminishing returns. I know guys are playing later, but yeah. Ben Roethlisberger, I know the elbow was part of the problem. It wasn't yeah. the same guy pre-surgery. Rivers can't throw the ball deep anymore, so retired at 37. Brady's an yep. anomaly. So you got the number four pick. That might be the time to uh, get All a quarterback. Right. If you're not going to take the quarterback at number four, 
then you yeah. trade down and get more picks, auction that pick off to the highest bidder who wants a quarterback and try to recoup draft capital to try to rebuild your roster. At least it's one of those two plays to me. Yeah. Or, or you could just trade down a bit because there's, there's depending on who you talk to, there's four guys that have first round grades, four quarterbacks. I don't know how soon they're going to go. Yeah. If you um, think that, if you but, think they're, if it's, you think it's Trevor Lawrence and then you can stick the names in a hat and pick one. Yeah. You trade yeah. down because you, you'd accumulate additional picks and still yep. get a guy where you're like, what's the difference between uh, Trey Zach Lance, Wilson Zach Wilson, and, Justin Fields, and yeah. we'll say Mac Jones. If you don't think there's much of a difference between them, yeah, that's another that's another route you could go as well. All right. Well, speaking of cap issues, New Orleans Saints and quarterbacks. The New Orleans Saints have a lot of questions, Joel. They, who's their quarterback going to be? Drew Brees has not announced officially he's retiring, but it looks oh like he's it. retiring. He he made a he made a move his contract, which I thought yeah he restructured he right. If he was going to retire, that his cap number was going to be twenty five million. Yeah. So they renegotiated where they dropped right. his base salary to his league minimum one point as one point oh seven five million. You only do yeah. that if you're going to retire because what you're okay. trying so to he's do, out. Yeah, what you're yeah. trying to do is you don't want to have all the bonus proration from the voiding years hit the cap in twenty twenty one. So you carry him on the roster till June second, and you can delay the proration until next year. So that was done for that reason. You have Taysom Hill under contract. I wouldn't have given him an extension. He could have played on his first round restricted tender. And yeah. seems like Sean Jameis. Payton has an affinity for Jameis Winston. Um, so it's probably going to be one of those two guys because I've never seen a situation like the Saints in terms of <laughs> the salary cap issues that this is unprecedented that even if you did have the cap go up to 10 million they were still going to have to make multiple moves in terms of restructuring contracts and cutting people and they kicked the can down the road with the best of them so um it was yeah I, I, not no, unexpected at, yeah they talk about having to pay the bills here um when you look i look i'm just looking at spo track but they are 32 uh negative 70 million um, 70 point, 70, 71 million, let's say, um, of cap space. And when yeah, it cap it's space, really, it's really 94 because there's, I don't know how it got reported this way, but Jared Cook has a real year in 2021. They have to physically cut him. Whereas I know some people have thought it was a voting year, so there's no cap charge for him, but he had, he had a uh, roster bonus, which had an escalator. So right now he's got a $22 million cap number. When you cut him, you're going to pick up, uh, you're going to have 2 million of dead money. So you're picking up 20 million of cap space for cutting Jared Cook, but that's not reflected in what you're looking at. What are they going to do? I mean, what is, if, if, if it's the worst cap situation in the league, uh, what do you think they end up doing if you just... Oh, they're going to go through multiple here. restructures. Like uh, they're going to pick up like 10 million of cap room from Cameron Jordan, add the voidable years. Uh, so they can stretch out the proration over five year people, five okay. years. People have talked about a lot of restructuring. Yeah. Michael Thomas, where they were going to trade him that adds yep. to the cap. Plus if you don't have drew Brees, why are you going to get rid of a weapon? Cause when he's healthy, he's great. So you're going to restructure him. You're going to pick up 9 million there. You're going to restructure Kamara. Uh, no, actually, he doesn't really give him that much, so you don't restructure him. You restructure Andres Pete. Uh, you, you're going to cut multiple players. Quan Alexander, you get $13 million for cutting him. Uh, Janoris Jenkins is probably gone. Uh, some of your mid-tier players like Malcolm Brown are probably gone. So you're going to see multiple restructures, multiple releases, and we're going to see how good of a coach Sean Payton is. <laughs> yeah i would not want to be their gm mickey loomis has uh, got a lot, a lot of decisions to make here um joel what is the worst when you look at some of these these bad cap situations what's the worst one that you've ever seen well until Take this year top of your head well this yeah. year it was the 2002 jacksonville jaguars and teams fall into a trap where if you <laughs> think you can win a super bowl yeah you, don't worry about tomorrow and you're worried about today. So your moves are made for the short term. That's yeah. back when Jacksonville had 
a lot of stars on their team, kept restructuring contracts. They were saved by one thing, the expansion draft. The yeah. Houston Texans took multiple guys off of them. That They took Gary Walker, Seth Payne, and Tony Baselli. And if I correct, the bonus proration – when you took someone in the expansion draft, went to the Texans. So you didn't have the type of dead money you would have. And then they cut a client of ours who, from a performance standpoint, didn't deserve to be cut. Keenan Ricardo, 90 catch, 1100 yard season. They cut him. And back then there were no post June 1 designations. You had to wait until June 2nd to get cut. And in that secondary market free agency, back then the money already dried up. He went to Tampa and got it got a Super Bowl ring, but uh, you don't get rid of a 90 catch 700 yard guy if you've managed no. the cap well. So that's probably the worst one I've seen. The Raiders had a pretty bad one when Reggie McKenzie first got there because I don't think Al Davis was thinking long term. He's thinking, hey, I need to win now. And he had like 55 million in dead money one year trying to clean up um, the Raiders cap situation to get them in a position where they could go forward and did get them, make them competitive a couple of years later, later after that. Is it just a situation where, you know, you, I mean, obviously you're not making these deals, but when you're a team, I guess if you feel like your window is, is right there and you feel like you've got a shot, it, it, that, I guess that's it, right? You just feel like, you know what, we're going all in and, you know, and then you end up making these deals where you got to rob Peter to pay Paul and, and then you got to pay them all. Yeah. And you can outrun it when the cap or, or maybe mostly outrun it when the cap goes up six, seven, eight percent each year. But when we have this unusual situation where the cap's going to go down, that's your problem. Yeah. Um, then the chicken comes on chickens, come home to roost where the credit card bill is due and you have to pay. Yeah. It. Philadelphia has been in that win now mode and they're, second worst situation even though they've got some logical exit points with some deals i they weren't they weren't counting on carson wentz being a guy they'd have to trade that deal was set up where you'd restructure it if he'd been what they thought he would be but now they're going to have the biggest individual dead money charge in league history of 33.8 million for trade versus like a 34.3 million dollar cap number so they would save eight hundred fifty thousand dollars, but still that's unusable cap space but i never thought he'd be traded this year but that appears to be what will happen uh matthew stafford goes to la lions get a starting quarterback they get a hall of draft picks uh rumor is reports are the eagles uh want that kind of deal uh you're gonna see a lot of quarterbacks right move around there's the whole deshaun watson situation down there i'll believe it when uh, i see it when he's traded i don't think Nick's, yeah. nick yeah nick casario wants his first major move to be I traded a franchise quarterback who's 25 when the idea is you try to find those guys and keep them. And yeah. I don't think he wants to set the precedent that um, if you, you can get what you want as a player, yeah. if you're disgruntled, that's a factor that I think yeah. people are underrating him, not wanting to set that precedent for other people to be able to come in the door afterwards and go, Hey, if I, I'm not happy, if I'm, if I'm happy I can force my way out. I, I know from personal experience when you got a new regime, that is a difficult, difficult obstacle to deal with when you're trying to get a new contract in a holdout yep. situation or, or trying to force a trade. All right. Well, let's wrap this up. I'm just going to put you on the spot here. Thumbs up. Th yes. No thumbs up, thumbs down, wherever you want to do it. Do they get a, do they get a deal done before the new league year? You think um, you mean TV money, TV deals? Yep. Yep. Uh, I'm going to say yes, because I think the owners are motivated to try to get it done. Does Carson Wentz get traded? Uh, yeah, but Philly's going to have to come off that uh, Matthew Stafford haul, because part of that was the they, the Rams were giving away Jared Goff. <laughs> that was more that was, that was part of the Brock Osweiler type thing here. Take him, we'll give you a second round pick. So you're not getting a Matthew Stafford haul. You have realistic expectations you can trade him. Who's the quarterback going to be in New Orleans? James Winston. Matt Ryan? Does he stay? Oh, stays. Julio Jones? Stays for another year because you got Calvin Ridley, who's pro who proved this year could be a number one. So I think uh, 
maybe a farewell season for both Matt Ryan and Julio Jones, unless it's a very wow. successful season. Wow. Oof. Uh, number four, you're, you're Terry Fontenot. What do you do? Uh, in what respect? Take, take a pick. Do you, do you draft best player available or you trade down? Uh, Based on what you just said. I'm taking my, if I think the quarterbacks are all equal, then I trade down and snag one and get additional picks. If there's one guy I like more than any of the others, um, then I'm taking that guy unless he's gone um, a pick ahead of me <laughs> at three or something. Okay. I could determine if another quarterback, if the quarterback you want is gone by a team who picks ahead of you, then that could change what your philosophy is in the, in the draft. Okay. So you're saying you're Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, Grady Jarrett are all going to be here. You trade down, you get some picks, Uh new head coach. You saw what Arthur Smith did with Ryan Tannehill and uh, how he adapts to his players. You got Terry Fontenot wanting to put his imprint on this team. Do you think the Falcons can be competitive and push for a division title? If that's the case. No, it's the bucks. Bucks are going to win the division. Um, think the bucks take it again. Yeah. No. You can, I don't think, it's going to be as competitive as it was this year because New Orleans, they're going to take a step back. So I think it's really, as long as Tom Brady's upright, they're winning the division. All right, Joel. Awesome to have you. We got to have you back when, uh, well, once once the dust settles here and uh, we get through that draft, I'd love to have you back on, man. Oh, anytime. Appreciate you having me on. 